Good evening and welcome to tonight's show. Right off the bat, we have a question from Patreon or YouTube member. I don't remember which one he is. Winston Smith. He says, Jeff, did you get an interview with Greg? I literally shouted for joy when I saw this. Uh, no, this is not an interview with Greg. This is a this is something else. Um, really interesting piece of content that I thought would make for a really great show. So it's it's an article that Greg wrote. Greg wrote this, so it's in Greg's words. Um, but it is not Greg. I did not get on with Greg. I wish I did. That would be great. Maybe someday. I got a couple. Of, I will say this. I was going to say this anyway. Right off the bat, um, I have a show coming up on Tuesday <clears throat> at a really weird time spot with this band called The Bad Nerves, who I've been listening to nonstop. I discovered them on Spotify, and I just can't get enough of this band. They are, if you're a fan of, if you're a fan of the Ramones, if you like the New York Dolls, if you like the Buzzcocks, if you like the Strokes, if you like Jay Retard, if you like, um, who else do they kind of remind me of? I mean, all of those things combined in a blender and you get the bad nerves. They have like a seminal freaking sizzling seminal is not the right word, but they have a sizzling. I don't know what you would call it. This banger of a self-titled album. And we're going to talk to them. I'm really excited to speak with them about their process. You know, they, I know they recorded it independently. It's going to be a really, really fun interview. And it's going to be during the day because they're over in England right now. They haven't broke yet. They're not. This is going to be. I have a feeling this is going to be one of the biggest rock bands like in the world. I have a feeling they're going to explode. I mean, the sad, the sad reality is that the Bad Nerves should have really come out twenty years ago. If they came out twenty years ago, they'd be the biggest thing in rock, in my opinion, personally. Uh, but I digress. I digress because we have a completely different show. I just wanted to say that's on Tuesday. Please do not miss that show. Or, I mean, you can miss that show. You'll just, you can catch it on, 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 on YouTube whenever you feel like it. I'm just saying, don't sleep on that show. It's going to be a good show. Okay. Let's, uh, let's get everything set up. I just turned this thing on. <clears throat> My voice is a little wonky tonight. Um, in case you missed it, we've been reading. Also, we've been doing a, um, Super rare, out of print Stephen King book, long lost Stephen King book that is not for public consumption, or at least um, at the request, at the out of respect for Stephen King's wishes and letting it go out of print, we are only doing it privately. So if you are into Stephen King and you want to check out a, a out of print Stephen King book, which is frankly quite one of the most terrifying, it's terrifying. I'm terrified reading it. I stopped I stopped abruptly last week because it was it was it gave me the heebie-jeebies. Why? Because it's so goddamn real. So, uh that's something you don't want to miss. We got Dan in the audience from Minnesota, Minnesota. Dan, Patreon member Dan, what's going on? How you doing? How you doing tonight? Thank you for joining us. All right, let's start. Let's start. Enough enough with the chitta chatter. Hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving. Hope everybody um everybody's gearing up for Christmas and Hanukkah and all that good stuff. New Year's. What's up, Chris? Chris is in the audience. Hello. How are you, sir? Okay. So what are we reading? This is uh, this is from Literary Hub. And it's very, um, you know, okay. So I'm a guy who talks about punk rock all the time. I love talking about punk rock. I love talking about music history in general. That seems to be the thing that people come to this channel for more than anything is to for the talk about music stuff. I love doing it. It's my favorite thing to talk about. One of my favorite things to talk about. And, um, you know, the problem, I don't know if it's a problem, but, you know, one of the things to acknowledge that I try to acknowledge as much as I possibly can is that I am, I'm, a, I'm freshly 37 years old, which means that I was not really around when punk was happening. I was, <laughs> I was, you know, I was born in 85. So when I talk about punk, I'm talking about it from a historical perspective. Yes, I went to punk shows growing up. Yes, I discovered punk as a teenager. I went through all those motions. But when we look at the history, I'm looking at it from a 
I am looking at it as a what I don't know what you would consider. Am I a th- I'm a third source perspective because I'm someone who's reading from a second source perspective, which which in fact would be a first source perspective. I don't know how you how that all works. Um, what's so exciting about the piece that I want to take a look at? What's up, Angus? Is in the comments. Hello, Angus. How are you, sir? Uh, what's so what I really want to look at in the in uh, no, no, sorry. The piece that I want to look at is from a guy who watched his music scene get documented in document, like in documentaries. You know, we had all these. Yeah, Penelope Spears. She did "Decline of the Western Civilization," that sort of thing. You have all these different people. Hello, Lyle. You have all these different people that have like documented um, punk, right? Uh, in a various different ways. And here is a guy, the lead singer, frontman, founder, uh, uh, Greg Graffin. They pronounced this, mispronounced his name, Greg Gaffin. I always want to say Gaffin anyway. It's Greg Graffin, Graffin with an R. He's like a giraffe. <laughs> it's not a giraffe. What am I talking about? Uh, and he talks about, he he wrote an article saying, be, uh, uh, what talking about what, what the early documentaries got wrong about the punk scene and i am just salivating to read it i have not read it yet as i do i generally do not read the articles here before we dive into them and the reason why is because again it's just like it's interesting to hear that perspective the perspective of someone who witnessed it who watched the documentaries like the rest of us have and has decided to express what they feel is wrong in the punk scene so like so this was published on November 18th, 2022 by Greg Graffin, who is like he's got like a degree in like some sort of advanced science field. Um and he's a really smart egg. He's a he's an academic. Very intellectually smart guy. I mean, you look at all of Bad Religion's lyrics and themes and stuff. I've seen Bad Religion twice now. A uh, very enjoyable experience. I, I don't, I, I don't, um, I'm not like a super fan. I'm not, you know, they're just, I think they're just a great band. You know, you always have a good time with bad religion. Angus says, I was alive during punk's beginnings, but since I lived in the Midwest, it was nearly impossible to hear anything until about 85. And Dan says, I have a few bad religion shows I filmed on my channel, including a real rare, rare full set of solo of a solo show. Uh, Dan, why don't you post your post your YouTube channel in the comments so people can find it, please, uh, or put it under the description of this video if you would be so inclined to do so. Dan likes to shoot stuff, zoology. I don't know what is that is that a is that a bad religion thing or I'm not like I said I am not I here's here so here are some things that I know about bad religion right off the top of my head. Um, Greg is the only constant member from the beginning. Uh, somewhere along the way. At the same time he was doing Circle, uh, the CJs, uh, Greg Hetson joined Bad Religion. Uh, Mr. Brett, Brett Ger- Gerwitz, Gerwitz uh, he was also a founding member. He started a record label called Epitaph, and they became one of the most successful independent labels of all time. And because of you know bands like Green Day exploding with Dookie in 94, you had that label along with fat records just doing they're not selling like insane numbers but they are making lots of money because they are independent distributors of this music they are making a lot of money oh dan is dan is saying that he's a he has a phd in zoology got it thank you for that appreciate it hello steve how are you Angus has seen them three times and talked to them once. They were super nice. They didn't act like rock stars. Once met Brian Baker backstage when Bad Religion was playing. I was I was backstage at a Warp Tour. I was, I was a friend. I was hanging a fringe on someone's entourage, and we we went through the back way. We saw there was Brian Baker just hanging out. Who's he hanging out with? He's hanging out with someone else from Bad Religion too. Maybe it was Greg Hudson. I don't know. Greg eventually left. Jay Bentley, Brentley, Bentley, he was there. He was there from day one. Oh, Mike is literally saying the exact same thing as I heard. Yeah. So Jay was there from day one. Brett plays on the albums, but not live anymore because according to him, he's too busy running 
the label to practice guitar and doesn't want to give his fans subpar performances. Fair enough. He came and went a bunch of times. He had he had some drug issues too, and I think that might have contributed it. Um and uh yeah, that's cool. I that's rad. I, I can dig that. They had that suit, you know, Sublime covered Bad Religion too. They covered, they called it Early Man. But I believe, that, no, no, sorry. The, the song is We're Gonna Die From Our Own Arrogance. They do a great cover of that, but that's also commonly uh, known as Early Man, secondhand. Dan says that Bad Religion is my favorite band of all time. I've met Greg a few times. I had him sign my first press bad religion ep he said this is a nice collectible i've seen them about 20 times that's awesome so that has that has uh we're gonna die for our own arrogance on it i believe because he started so they Gr greg and those guys they started the band in like 1980 or something he was like 15 years old when he started that band he's been doing it for most of his life he's been doing it longer than he was when he was alive when he started it i guess would be the way to say it right something like that uh yeah okay so brett was gone from 93 until 2002 and then left again sometime in the 2010 so he he comes and goes but he's running this label and the label really fell off so i you know i discovered so much i guess modern punk rock music. it's not modern anymore it's 30 years old i discovered a lot of the modern punk music or contemporary punk, punk, punk music of the day through that label through the punkorama series that's how i discovered so many bands the first time i ever heard tsol code blue was on punkorama too you know um but every every band that was on punkorama the first time i heard that band like first time i heard pennywise first time i heard no effects i think i'm sure you know uh first time i heard bad religion all of those bands because of the Punkorama series. So, um, so Brett wasn't around during the heyday of the Punkoramas. I mean, the sweet spot for Punkorama is from Punkorama two all the way up to Punkorama six, which is roughly nineteen ninety six to two thousand one. Uh, Bouncing Souls are also on Punkorama. That's how first time I ever heard Bouncing Souls was that way. Okay, come on. Let's uh let's let's get into this now. So this is by Greg. Greg is a he says punk was becoming stereotyped as having no intellectual merits at all. There's the there's the thing. Yes, the humpers. So I bought both humpers that I have I have plastic valentine and I have the other one. Uh the humpers was such a great band. They had mutate with me, and of course, the delectable steel toed sneakers, one of the best punk like like uh 90s punk rock songs ever steel toed sneakers what do we got we got sneakers we got steel motherfucker kicking out the doors kicking out the walls kicking out the doors kicking out i love that freaking band dude you everybody go listen to bad nerves okay go listen to the bad nerves not because they remind me of contempt of 90s punk rock i'm just saying you should go check them out they give me that 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 feeling of energy that i get that i like whatever <laughs> All right, all right, all right, right. I'm not going to ignore the comments now because I got to read this and then we'll, we'll go back to more comments, okay? Punk was ripe for exploitation. This is, again, this is by Greg Graffin from Bad Religion. Punk was ripe for exploitation. Outlandish desperados were all that was left of the scene. And these were seized upon by popularizers who were uninterested in telling a more compassionate or empathetic tale about the more worthy aspects of the genre. There are guys who would wait their whole life for someone close to them to finally kick the bucket just so they could say he didn't suffer fools, calculating bastards who memorize such phrases and use them opportunistically to inflate their own reputations without giving due credit to those who came before. Such artless saps love to throw shit at the wall and see who is interested in what sticks. This is what happened in the early documentary period of the punk scene in South California. So I'm sure he's going to bring up decline of the Western civilization, I, I would imagine. Uh, certain promoters and people behind the scenes, scenes started telling stories about punk and the consumers of mainstream media listened. 
Storytellers were emerging who were trying to make a business out of the punk scene. In the spring of 1984, my friend Phil invited me over to his recording studio, Spinhead Studios, one day after classes. This because he's in college, right? I mean, 1984, he's probably about 19 years old. His pal Dave, an aspiring filmmaker, also often hung out there too. He had just brought over something for us to watch on video. There's this new film coming out by BYO. It's supposed to be about the scene from a couple years ago. I've got a copy, copy of it. We watched it together as the opening credits. Oh, it was, of course, the classic punk documentary, Another State of Mind, right? Uh, cool, I said. I know these guys. Maybe it will be about something positive other than the violence and thuggery and drugs. If you haven't seen Another State of Mind, you should. So the guys in Youth Brigade, along with Social Distortion, and who else? Who was the third band? Somebody think, somebody help me out here. Who is the third band that was out? They, they, they hop on a school bus, and they go all the way out. They go they, they convert the school bus, and they go on this tour, and the, the tour falls apart. And I believe Another State of Mind is actually a Social Distortion song. You can see a very, very young Mike Ness composing mommy's little monster right uh minor threat no they go to the they go to the discord house they go to the discord house but is minor threat the third band i don't think so now i now i now i gotta look it up god damn it maybe i'm wrong maybe well, let's see here another state of mind came out in 1984 let's take a look here Social Distortion and Youth Brigade. It's just two bands. It's not. Why did I think there was a third band? Yeah, they hang out with the, at the Discord house. It was directed by Adam Small and Peter Stewart. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, Minor Threat is in it, obviously, but they're not. They didn't go on the tour. They didn't go on the tour. It was just It was just two bands. It was Youth Brigade and Social Distortion. My, yeah. Okay. Okay. And that's when. You know, that's when uh, 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 allegedly Mike Ness threw up all over Doyle's bed when they stayed with Jerry and Doyle of the Misfits at the Kayafa residence. Mike Ness threw up and Doyle beat him up. And it must have happened on another stand of mind. I don't know that for a fact. <coughs> um, yeah. Yeah, so it was just two bands. My 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 mistake there. I thought there was a third one. The movie depicts depicts a national tour by Social Distortion and Youth Brigade in 1982. Despite its good intentions, the band Youth Brigade Brigade was narrating throughout, interwoven with blurbs from other punks in scenes from other cities in North America. It failed to offer punks much hope for a unified intellectual narrative vision. In fact, as the movie went on, I got more and more disheartened. It starts off depicting a huge punk audience slam dancing over the narration of Youth Brigade's singer claiming this movie is about music by kids for kids, which was bullshit because those kids on the film were not slamming to any music made by Youth Brigade. I had been to shows by Youth Brigade. They couldn't draw that many people to their shows. So strike one, I protest. So so Greg is, is straight up calling out shenanigans on Youth Brigade saying that this couldn't, that they're, that the document, the, the, the doc, uh, the, the, the the um god i'm at a loss for words the documentarian i'm gonna make up a word right now the documentarian this shift <laughs> what the <f> <coughs> that, that did not work out that did not roll off the tongue the way i wanted it to the documentarianism the documentarianism i just made that up the documentarianism is is not authentic it's not truthful so strike one i protested this isn't even a youth brigade show so why is he talking over this first scene in the movie as if it had anything to do with drawing those kids together 
Within the first two minutes, the singer narrator was revealing that some sort some sort of mission is behind the counterfeit concert footage. He was singing the praises of his organization, the Better Youth Organization. Jesus Christ, I said, this is a propaganda film? I mean, listen, on some level, when it comes to document documentaries, no documentary is going to be 100% authentic. The every every which way there's some sort of artistic license that is taken in in one way or another, okay? It just happens, man. It's just it's just the reality. Um it's impossible to be, you know, because the other thing too is you have to be objective completely. You can't have, you have to have as little bias as possible when you're making a documentary. The first thing that you should look for when watching a documentary, whatever it is, and a, you know, a, a great example of this is, um, I, I hate to bring this into it, but I'm going to do it because it just, it's, it's the perfect example. Leaving Neverland, the Michael Jackson documentary from HBO. Now, I want to clarify because in this day and age, we have to clarify everything that we say on the internet, lest we be dragged through the mud. I want to clarify. Michael Jackson absolutely, um, absolutely guilty of something. I don't know what to, the exact detail of what he was guilty of. He is guilty of being criminally inappropriate with children. How about that? Okay. In a criminal way, Michael Jackson was inappropriate with children. To what extent? I don't think anybody to this point has been able to definitively tell us what exactly Michael Jackson has done. Okay. And part, and there's a lot of reasons why. The one factor, one factor is the fact that Michael Jackson on several occasions chose to settle out of court for a lot of reasons. He settled, whether he was guilty or innocent, he settled because A, it was going to save him money. B, he would he could avoid a lengthy trial that would cost him far more money. He did there were a lot of reasons that made sense from a business perspective, from a money perspective, for him to settle out of court, even to the tune of $20 million. And once he did that, he opened himself up to a lot of different people that were looking to financially benefit in the in similar sort of ways. Now, again, does that conflict with the fact that Michael Jackson was criminally guilty of something with children? No, it does not. But the point is, is that nobody knows exactly for sure what happened. And I'm digging, as I dig myself deeper into this hole, of a, of a can of worms that I wish I didn't, but all to prove my point about the authenticity of documentary filmmaking. You have Leaving Neverland, okay? Leaving Neverland came out a few years ago, and it was a big to-do, and I was very interested to watch it because here are these guys who were claiming that they were, you know, uh, that they were, you know, taken advantage of by Michael Jackson criminally uh, in, in, a, in that kind of way that I can't say publicly on YouTube. And, um, you know, uh, I'm watching the documentary and it's just, you know, they didn't, it's just them. It's just the two victims talking. We don't hear from anybody else, but the two victims sharing their stories. So what it really is, it is a victim testimonial. It's not, the, it's not an objective documentary that's hearing from every side that there is to hear from. We're just hearing from the two victims' perspectives. And the, here's the problem with leaving Neverland. Problem one, that they are re they are 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 dramatizing interview scenes. So there's a scene where the guy, uh, one of the guys, one of the two guys, he is sitting there and he is dressing, he's dressed in a certain way. They're in a cabin and he's telling a very emotional story. And as it turns out, this emotional story was filmed over two days. What does that mean? It means that the dude who's telling something emotional, causing him to cry, had to 
uh, break, came back di- wearing the exact same clothes. That was the other thing too. They were uh, they were shooting this interview over two days as if it happened all on the same day. And so that brings me to my point of how authentic is what we are seeing authentic if this guy is shooting this very intense emotional thing over two days wearing the same exact clothes as to appear as if it's one interview. The documentarian wants you to think that this happened in one interview. That to me is suspect. Does that mean that Michael Jackson is innocent? No, not saying that. So not saying that. I'm saying that that it pokes holes in the in in what the the thing is in in the thing <coughs> in their in their testimony. The other thing too, at the very end, one of the guys he's burning all the stuff that Michael Jackson gave him. He's actually throwing these priceless Michael Jackson artifacts into the fire like thriller jacket like all this stuff that he had from his time with michael um as it turns out he actually sold all that stuff because he needed money he sold all of that stuff those were reproduced things that was a staged scene of him throwing things in the fire so the documentarian is trying to make you feel a certain way by emotionally manipulating what should be something that should be authentically seen. And so when I look at the documentary Leaving Neverland after reading these different things, that makes me question the authenticity of the victims and their testimonies and what is being presented to me because it's not being presented to me in a genuine way. You have, you know, and then all sorts of stuff came out that the, 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 the train station where one of those things, one of the incidents supposedly happened was built a year after the incident supposedly took place and they showed the blue, whatever. You have all these Michael Jackson truthers who are like (coughs) trying to prove Michael Jackson's innocence, which is bullshit because Michael Jackson, again, criminally guilty, but never proven in a court of law uh, properly. That's the reality. That is the reality. Um, So the point is, is that you really have to be very careful about how you look at a documentary, you know, and there are some documentaries you can just take right on the face, the, the, the face, you know, uh, and go, okay, well, you know, this is not exactly, it's not trying, it's just a talking head thing and everybody's doing, you know, sort of there. And then you have stuff where it's like, we're in, we're in the environment or we're trying to, you know, uh, display emotion authentically. There needs to be, genuine truth behind that does that make any sense what i'm saying it has to be genuine if you have a guy burning paraphernalia uh memorabilia that he got personally from michael jackson that turns out that he actually sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars 10 years prior on ebay auctions or some sort of auction house and then they're buying reproductions does that lend to emotional authenticity after telling us this like terrible victim story? No, it doesn't. And so the idea here that Greg presenting about how, you know, punks, you know, here's a a band, this band youth brigade talking about playing shows and seeing the shows that they play versus what is being shown on this documentary. It's not authentic. It's trying to issue. It's trying to elicit an authentic feeling in that here is here are these kids, you know, uh, doing it themselves, trying to be entrepreneurial and express themselves through their art in an entrepreneurial kind of way. That's what DI, DIY punk is, right? Most beautiful to me. My, that's religion for me, man. Like that's the most beautiful thing in the world to me. Um, but what he's seeing, he can already pick apart what he is seeing on. The screen so it's like that's the weird thing about documentaries man it's like that you have to look at who's making the documentary why are they making what uh what is the agenda of 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 them making it you know do they have a particular bend you know is the party unbiased in any way shape or form that those sorts of things so that was a very long-winded detour from the article i'm sorry 
where we talked about Michael Jackson for a really long time, way longer than we should have. Um, you know, they sticky, man. It's a sticky situation. That's what happens. And you know what else is sticky? Freaking stickers, man. Freaking stickers. Riotstickers.com is the official sponsor of the From His Channels. And matter of fact, I just was talking with Sharpie Riot himself, and we are um he it, we we are once again uh we uh, uh Riot Stickers remains a a a proud sponsor of the From His Channel. And uh, we are so glad to 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 ju jump into 2023 with riotstickers.com. What's so great about riotstickers.com? Well, first of all, they put a UV coating on their stickers. So when the sun shines on the stickers, the image doesn't bleach. Number two, the uh, the stickers, they're made of vinyl. You know why they're printed on vinyl? Because it makes them waterproof. So when you stick those stickers on outdoor surfaces, your design, your sticker is not going to fall there from the rain because it's vinyl that's awesome that's a great thing uh you can even see the banner behind me that was printed by riot stickers well let me tell you riot stickers and i we are doing a special promotion you can only get this promotion right here on the channel in the description of this channel it's from us.com sorry why did i say that riotstickers.com backslash from us check out in the description below you can find it riotstickers.com backslash from us uh you're gonna get a thousand stickers for $79. That's seven cents per sticker. You can't find a better deal. $79, a thousand stickers. It just, there, you just can't get a better deal than that. That is the truth. Um, <coughs> Ridestickers.com. Let's play the quick 60 second song and we'll get back to uh, Greg. All right, we are back. And look who's here in the comments. We have John of Doom. You know, John of Doom. Voice of Doom have a show coming up, by the way, you guys. I think it's uh, December 18th, right? I believe. It's on a Sunday. It's on a Sunday in December. Very excited for their show. It's coming up. It's going to be great. It's going to be good times. Um, let's take a look at some of these comments here. A friend, a friend of mine plays hockey with Greg up in Ithaca. Is he? Is that where he is up in Ithaca? Huh. Believe it or not, Jeff, I can separate the art, the artist from the art, like listening to Michael Jackson or watching Apocalypto. <laughs> Listen, I I like Michael Jackson's music a lot, and we listen to it around the house. And yeah, I mean, uh, he's a he's a fucked up guy for sure, but doesn't change the fact that the man knows how to dance and that is not me i just want to again clarify i do think michael jackson is a guilty person who has done criminal things to underage children i just don't think it's ever been proven in a court of law properly i don't think it hasn't i mean it legally hasn't and you know i'm not saying that it shouldn't i'm just saying that that there that there is absolutely he is absolutely guilty of sin of something i just don't think that the, th the things that he has been taken to trial for, uh, maybe I don't know, maybe some of, some of them. But for instance, this last thing, this Leaving Neverland documentary, I I think those guys don't have Jack. I don't. I just don't. I don't. I I just didn't. I didn't think that was authentic. Uh, Angus says, unfortunately, I have interacted with Jackson Truthers on Twitter. They are relentless and often not truthful. Yes, yes, that is true. 
Um, yeah, and we can't deny the fact that that um, that even though Mel Gibson is a piece of sh- anti-Semitic piece of shit, that he knows how to make one hell of a good movie like Apocalypto, which I love. Ah, uh, he teaches at Cornell. I did not know that. Okay, okay, I did not know that. Okay, all right. Let's get back to the reading, everybody. We're getting back to this. Um, shit. What did I just do? You know, I am just all butterfingers today. This is not, I feel bad for whoever is listening to this on podcast, Spotify podcast. Just want to check when. Yeah, Voice of Doom, Voice of Doom, 2 p.m., Bowerly Electric on Sunday, December 18th in New York City. If you want to catch Voice of Doom, I have it on my calendar. Do you have it on yours? That is that is what we need to know. All right, back to the program here. So strike one. He sees this inauthentic audience, right? In the in the crowd. It's not, it's not truthful to what Youth Brigade, the, the audience that Youth Brigade pulls, it's not truthful. Okay. So that is that is strike one right there. <coughs> this isn't even a, a youth brigade show. So why is he talking over this first scene of the movie as if he had anything to do with drawing those kids together? Within the first two minutes, the singer narrator was revealing some sort of mission. Right, we already read this about the better youth organization. Jesus Christ, I said, is this a propaganda film? Um, the next thing to catch my attention was an interview by one of my heroes, Keith from the CJs. I got to abbreviate CJs because YouTube does not like that word. Keith Morris from the CJs. I respect Keith greatly. He inspired me. He wasn't a kid and he didn't write music for kids. He co-wrote and sang some of the most important punk songs ever to come out of Los Angeles. But you wouldn't have guessed that they even knew who he was. Not only did they fail to mention how important he was to the LA punk scene, they didn't even list his affiliation with the CJs during the interviews or credits. The film kept harping on how bands have to do it yourself if you want to be heard. But the filmmakers showed the opposite strategy. They essentially asked for help from others to make their film. And they did so with no intention of crediting them. Is this really supposed to convince anyone that somehow this is an example of a better youth or good aspects of our punk scene? This is turning into a real shit pie, I uttered. Oh, I'm going to start using that word. That is really, really great. A shit pie. (laughs) A shit pie. Oh, man, this is really turned into a shit pie. This show is really turned into a shit pie because I can't keep my head on straight. And furthermore, better youth organization sounds like some kind of eugenics nonsense. I was reading about the dangers of genetic experimentation and social engineering in my evolution classes. Real tasteless shit to anyone with an intellectual bent or knowledge of basic history. This I chalked up to poor taste, but perhaps let it slide as artistic license. Strike two. Now, hold on a second, Greg. I have a bone to pick with Greg here. He says the band keep, kept harping on how on how bands have to do it yourself if you want to be heard, but the filmmakers showed the opposite strategy. They essentially asked for help from others to make their film. That still counts as doing it yourself. I wouldn't I wouldn't take that away from them. You know, when you're a filmmaker, you know you can't just uh, sometimes you know, especially back then when you needed money to buy actual film, it wasn't shooting on digital cards. That's doing it yourself means you are doing it yourself. And part of doing it yourself is uh, producing. And part of producing is finding people to rally behind your cause. It doesn't literally mean doing everything by yourself. I have done everything by myself and it's crazy. It's not something that anybody should do. It's really stupid. That's something that you do when you literally have no money to do anything and you have to do everything by yourself. But a good producer is going out there and recruiting people for your cause. So that would still count as doing it yourself. That's my rebuttal, Greg. My one rebuttal so far. Strike one, Greg. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding, Greg. Just kidding. Greg can't. Greg will never watch this. He can't. He doesn't hear 
what I am saying. Dan says, I once drove from Minneapolis to Ann Arbor to see Bad Religion play in a small club, The Blind Pig, in 1998. They played like 40 songs over two hours. First time I met Greg was after the show. So is he he's really chill, huh? Like he, he'll just he's hanging out. You can you can like uh rub elbows with him. That's pretty cool. Um, but when the movie finally struck out, so it's already it's got two strikes for Greg. The movie finally struck out when it showed a packed concert featuring images of the CJs and bad religion on stage, but choreographed to the music of Youth Brigade over the footage. What? Okay. I it's been a long time since I have watched an uh another state of mind. I don't remember there being CJ or bad religion footage in it. I mean, I'm sure there was. I just wasn't paying attention to that. But to put I would say okay, so th there there's two okay, so to put your own band over your own band's music over the CJs and Bad Religion, that's a weird thing to do. I understand why they did it. I still think it's a weird thing. It's not something that I would do personally. If I had a band and I was making a documentary, I would not do that personally for a lot of reasons. One, I just don't think it's authentic, and I think it would make me feel uncomfortable, and I wouldn't want anybody to think I was trying to steal the thunder of the CJs or Bad Religion. But we can see here that Greg has a personal bent. See, Greg's writing the article. Just like with documentaries, you have to look and see why does Greg have an ax to grind with another state of mind so bad? It, does, it sounds like, I don't know what else is going to come up in this article, but it sounds like his real problem is with another state of mind using bad religion footage. Doesn't sound like they got permission to do bad religions footage. Why do I think Youth Brigade, Youth Brigade did this? I'll tell you why. Because they didn't have the rights to bad religion or CJ's music. It was probably too expensive for them. The person who, who the, the images of CJ and B, oh no, it's featuring images. So maybe it's not footage. It might just be pictures. They probably had the pictures. They probably knew the person who took the pictures. They probably wanted to incorporate the pictures to make the movie a little bit bigger by having names like bad religion and CJ's, you know, having that prestige uh, associated with it and probably figured, Hey, you know, we're not going to ask the band's permission, but if we have the guy who has the copyright of the photo, because whoever takes that photo owns the copyright. And there are many, believe me, there are many musicians out there who will be very upset to <laughs> to admit that that is true but it's true <coughs> it's a it's like a double it's a double axe right if if i take if i take your video i need your permission to do anything with it commercially but if you use my video of you even though it has you in it that's my video that i own the copyright of that that recording i own the recording i own the copyright of that recording you need my permission and it's a weird, slippery slope. So here's an example of the Youth Brigade boys. Maybe, I'm making an assumption here, maybe having the copyright owner's permission to use the photographs, but not the band members themselves. And overlaying their music underneath, because obviously they probably don't have, because they're making this movie by themselves, they probably don't have the money to pay for CJ music and bad religion music, even if they wanted to. Although, okay, another flip side. This movie was made in 1982 when the CJs and BR, bad religion, were really putting out music by themselves, right? So it would, you know, argue to stand that it's not like licensing a bad religion song in 2022 or a CJ song in 2022, or it might set you back a few few thousand dollars if you contact the band you probably could do it for free so there's a lot of weight in both side on both sides of this argument and i am not king solomon i can't really pass judgment but it's interesting to sort of look at all the different all the different angles of of the situation i guess would be the right way to say it 
I would be I would be annoyed. I, I would be annoyed for sure. Uh, Greg Greg is right to be annoyed. He says these were by far the most dramatic sequences of the movie. Oh, now I gotta now want to rewatch another state of mind. Elated punk rockers dancing to music that they loved by the CJs and Bad Religion, two bands. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Dancing to the music that they love. Hold on. Now he's saying something different. Now he's saying that it did feature music by the CJs and Bad Religion. Before, he was saying that it's the music in the very previous sentence. Greg, I hate to be semantic here, but in the previous sentence, you said it was it was choreographed to music of Youth Brigade, and now you're saying that here's elated punk rockers dancing to music that they love by the CJs and BR. So did they use your music or did they not? In any case, what upsets Greg is that it's two bands that were never mentioned in the film. So they were never credited. The disconnect was that these images were accompanied by overdub music from the Youth Brigade. Okay, so he's not being very clear here in that previous sentence. So it in fact was music by the Youth Brigade, a band that never elicited such enthusiasm nor drew that many punks to their shows. And the truth is, the only reason why I really know the Youth Brigade in the first place is two reasons. One, I know that they opened for the Misfits. And two, another state of mind. In fact, one could argue that the Youth Brigade's place in punk rock history is because of another state of mind. It's certainly not, you know, at least on a national scale, I would say. I mean, they're one of the they're one of the lesser known punk bands of the day. So that's interesting. That is interesting. Um this rendered the entire project a sham piece of propaganda as far as I was concerned. This video was plagiarism, I yelled. Is there such a thing? I asked Phil. Asked Phil I didn't know, but it sounded good to me. And both Dave and Phil got a kick out of my film review. Hmm. Um. Wow, he is really he he's roasting he's roasting those 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 youth brigade guys. Dan says I think he meant the live crowd were getting down to CJ and BR. Well, yeah, but the music was they had overlaid their own music. They had overlaid. Youth Brigade music to BR and CJ. So that's interesting. Greg says, I remembered the uncredited Bad Religion concert well. It was such an incredible turnout. Over a thousand punks or so it seemed. I took a pause between songs to say to the large punk audience, let's switch places. Everyone in the audience up, up on stage. And when we start the next song, we will do the world's largest stage dive. That moment is captured on the film at about 44 minutes in. At that moment, we broke into our song, We're Only Gonna Die. Okay, so it's not, yeah, we're only gonna die for our arrogance. And mayhem ensued. I didn't know that anyone was filming it, but I'm glad that it was captured on camera because it's one of the truly, it's because it's one of the truly breathtaking moments of satisfaction I had on stage at that young age, which is really rad. That's cool. Uh, that song was played on Rodney on the R ROQ and the entire, so Rodney, Rodney, oh God, I can't, I don't remember his last name. That dude on that radio station was Rodney Bingerheimer, I think his name was. I mean, that was like, that guy was so instrumental on the West Coast for punk rock. I mean, he was playing everybody. He was playing and, and involved such 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 a a uh, an important element of of West Coast punk rock scene, uh, and the entire punk community seemed to embrace it at that time of this particular concert. Unfortunately, by the time the film came out in 1984, it felt like whiplash because the movie took two years to come out. Not only were we uncredited in the movie but the punk scene itself had devolved and had shrunk to a fraction of its size. By that time, punk crowds that used to number over a thousand were now averaging around a hundred. The legacy seemed to be dying. And these storytellers seemed only intent on self aggrandizement. You know, it's, I gotta say, like I, I was really trying to, you know, 
I was trying to lift up the, the guys in the youth brigade, but I, I got to tell you, man, this is pretty damning. This is pretty damning. Greg, Greg it really has a point here. Uh, he does, man. He really, really does. Angus says, most of the information that I knew about Youth Brigade was from the pages of Maximum Rock and Roll Fanzine. So there you go. But Angus, you're talking about a fanzine that was an important piece of media for punkers back in the day pre-internet. But when we think, when we look at this thing almost five decades on, four decades on, I, I mean, I really think what solidifies those guys is another state is another state of mind more than anything else. So um, where I, okay. So Greg says, I felt then as I do today, if you're trying to point out how good your community or your organization is, you should start by giving credit to those who helped build the scene that you're claiming as your own. This, exper this experience was par for the course. Around this time, there started a trend where self-appointed punk experts began to outline their vision of punk morality as if some kind of mystic rule, real, rule book had been lying in wait for a prophet to emerge to decipher and to decipher it and let all the punks know the score. Like the intention given to televangelists and old time radio uh, religion. The mainstream media was only too happy to feature these teen punk philosophers, and it came across as some kind of attempt to form a new religion. A bad religion. <laughs> Sweeping statements, bold generalizations, no data. If you don't fight society, society will win. You got to do your own thing because nobody in this society will ever help you out. It was something that would eventually build into a national pastime. Whoever had the camera on them could claim just about anything. And a certain portion of the viewers would believe it without question. Punk was becoming stereotyped as having no intellectual merits at all. As if punk was associated with all of society's ills, TV shows, highlighted its ugliest aspects. Some of us refused to listen to false mandates and knew how to spot them, but others failed to recognize propaganda. The propagandists themselves failed to realize that when they spouted off about what is or isn't punk, they flunked authority 101. Pres prescriptive thinking undermined their own oratory and lost anyone with half a brain. Plenty of punks, it seemed, were all too happy to voice their beliefs and conscripts with, ex with expectation that others would follow blindly. Sadly, the unwashed masses didn't want to do the work of learning how to think. They just wanted to be told what to think. There were all too many punk bands who craved such a following, any following. Sure, I wanted one too, but I preferred it to be a microcosm of society, a microcosm of the universe, an enlightened bunch. For this, we had to assume we were playing to an intelligent audience and give them something to nourish their minds. I wasn't interested in hearing about my cohort's unexamined beliefs, and to be frank, I didn't care if they thought I was punk or not. I clung to the notion that music was sufficient to express an interesting point of view, even a def defiant one. If that was liked by punks, all the better. For many years, I wasn't interested in doing any more interviews or sharing half-baked philosophy with fanzines. I was content to acquire knowledge rather than disseminate it at that point in my life. Bad Religion was in the midst of a three-year hiatus between albums. Neither I nor Brett wrote a single punk song. I was glad to be getting trained in informed opinion at the university, restricting my thinking, honing skepticism, trying to focus my thoughts, and making statements validated by factual data. Reading the independent thinkers, intellectuals, Darwin and Heckel, A.S. Romer and S.J. Gold, everybody's got abbreviations, Ernest Mayer and E.O. Wilson. Sagan Brownowski 
and leaky. Uh, Krams, Chomsky and Hardin, Hesse and Nabokov, Casey and DeLeo, Sears, masters of their disciplines. They're who I admired. And their achievements in arts, letters, and science were aspirational motivation for me. Punk was becoming a stereotype, was becoming stereotyped as having no intellectual merits at all, as if punk was associated with all of society's ills. TV shows highlighted its ugliest aspects. The Phil Donahue show, the popular daytime talk show, featured punk runaways and downtrodden kids. Chips, the, nas the nation's top primetime poli police drama, featured punk criminals. Even the feature film, ah, it does get mentioned. It did get mentioned. The Decline of Western Civilization by Penelope Spears focused more on the violence, nihilism, and teenage rebellion rather than making any kind of coherent sense of the film's title. I watched the movie wishing to hear more songs, see more performances from my favorite bands, but instead I had to sit through interviews with punk scenesters many of whom were acquaintances being elevated in their portrayal as some sort of philosophers. So he's talking about guys, you know, that he knew, whatever, off the street or whatever, just, you know, punks that are now suddenly being immortalized on film as being these, you know, philo <laughs> philosophers of the, of the, of the movement. It was a totally, I can't pronounce this word deep, Let's let's look up this word actually because I don't know what it means. Uh, depopulate, depopulate. Let's. What it's, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Let's see. Give it a second. <clears throat> Here we go. Uh, depopulate. It's an adjective lacking in numbers or variety of species. Uh, okay, lacking. It was a total lacking of numbers of intellectual focus, and most disappointing. The bands were portrayed to look more like a freak show and less like an artistic community cemented by great music. So Greg saw the artistic merits of his community cemented by great music and the media, in this case, documentary film, is sort of, and, you know, talk show TV and, television, you know, primetime television are taking the the most um, sensationalist aspects of what punk rock is and sort of exaggerating it further, heightening the exaggerated things further through the way that they are portrayed in the media. <coughs> Nowhere in these films or features did they talk about punk as being musically and lyrically compelling. They failed to touch on what made punk so attractive that it could fill concert halls just a couple of years ago, but now struggled to fill small clubs. The punk follow-up by Spheres called Suburbia wasn't any better at adding either nuance or general interest to the punk scene. It merely capitalized on and hastened the formation of a seedy negative stereotype. But, you know, Suburbia was made by New World Pictures, which is Roger Corman. Roger Corman it was the guy behind Suburbia who, who made Suburbia a reality, you know, even though uh, Penelope directed it. And it was supposed to be, uh, it's an exploitation film cashing in on the latest teenage craze, which is something that, that you know, independent filmmakers had been doing for almost 30 years at that point, 20 years at that point starting in the 50s with the rock and roll movies. I mean, that was a, you know, they had the beach movies in the 60s, you know, the surfing, the beach, the beach bunnies and the whatever, the surfing guys, whatever you want to call those movies, beach blanket bingo. And, you know, the 80s, you know, you had punk rock. So, of course, they're going to be a punk rock movie. So I don't can't, I, again, I, not disagreeing with Greg here, but I would just say, like, it needs a little bit more, a little bit more understanding in a wider scope you know, then being upset that you're the thing that you came up in is being experienced by people outside of it, even if it's in a distorted way from the way you see it. It merely capitalized and hastened, uh, right, we already read that, loosely scripted actual kids from the punk scene rather than trained actors. Some of them, 
you had Flea in there. Flea was, you know, at that point was a working actor on some level. Um, were asked to act out scenes in the telling of a story about a homeless teens in the Southland. Drugs, alcohol, family dissonance, runaways, and so forth. Yeah. I felt like screaming when I saw it. Yes, we get it. But what does punk have to do with it? These things are so commonplace in American life that I suspected that the director was simply exploiting kids on the screen, getting them to play themselves in roles that were stereotyped, which is sad to me. But nothing saddened me more than the onstage image of Andre, that kid with the wooden leg who Ribo, who Ribo and I befriended as schoolboys back in Racine. All his useful exuberance was gone. Now he appeared as one of the film's characters, a drug-addled runaway being exploited for his disability under the thinly veiled premise of storytelling. So, I mean, in, in every example, in both examples, Greg is speaking from a very personalized point of view here. He knew these people. He was playing himself, but he was being used as a symbol of an incorrect and unflattering stereotype. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Even though I had lost touch with him a lifetime ago, I still felt a sense of friendship and loyalty, and I believe that he deserved better treatment. We made friends as mere tots, according to the dictates of our academic upbringing. Due to the strong urging of our mothers, the administrators, we befriended Andre in the spirit of humanistic, compassionate values that they instilled. What I saw on screen was a breach of humanism, a glorification of vulgarity. I always found it puzzling that Black Flag was depicted by Spheres as some sort of deeply, uh, <laughs> deeply philosophical cult. So he's, wait, I got to read that line again. He says, I always found it puzzling that Black Flag was depicted by Spheres as some sort of deeply philosophical cult. The truth is a punk had to make a choice when he decided to go see them play. While the cops were busy busting heads outside the venue, inside was a parallel, unconscious, contradictory absurdism, only apparent. These ads keep on making me lose my place. While the cops were busy busting heads outside the venue, inside was, an, was a parallel, unconscious, contradictory absurdism, only apparent to the thinking person. Black flag concerts were always dressed with a one-man police force, a roadie named Mugger. Everybody knows who. If you if you know Black Flag, if you've know the about the band or read about their history, you know about Mugger, who drove the van. He he was there for all of Black Flag's exploits. He had his own band, uh, with a very interesting name. And apparently, Mugger is now like a successful like stockbroker kind of guy. But he used to really. He used to rough it in that van. In any case, he says, <laughs> only apparent to a thinking person, black flag concerts always were dressed with a one-man police force, a roadie named Mugger, crouched in the front of the band, mad-dogging the audience, daring any punker to test his might and come up on stage for a celebratory stage dive. Not on my watch was the posture of the most famous bodyguard of the LA punk scene getting punched in the face for wanting to stage dive was somehow deemed acceptable by many punkers at the black flag show. So basically if you weren't getting clubbed in the head by the LAPD outside of the venue, you risk getting punched in the face by mugger inside at the concert, but none of this was touched on in the decline. Nowhere in these films or features did they talk about the uh, talk about punk as being musically and lyrically compelling. He keeps saying that, but he doesn't talk about any of any like any other merits of punk. Like again, go back to this idea of like the idea of like of of self fulfillment, artistic self fulfillment through entrepreneurship, entrepreneurialism, being an entrepreneur. Like there's so many things. But he just keeps saying the lyrical or musical merits. Like, it's isn't there more to it than that, Greg? I mean, come on. Um, 
They failed to touch on what made punk so attractive that it could fill concert halls just a couple of years ago, but now struggle to fill small clubs. They didn't give enough attention to the essence of what made the SoCal scene unique. The multitude of bands that sprung up from the Southland and the songs that made them great. But Greg, isn't it more than that? Is it just that? The music was in a quagmire. Bands stopped writing good songs. So began a period where preaching about proper conduct in the punk scene overshadowed the music of the scene. Punk went into a sort of hibernation. Okay, so this is actually uh, an excerpt from Punk Paradox, a memoir by Greg. How about that? So this is his book, which he just put out. Oh, and Dan, who beat me to the punch. I wasn't looking at the comments. Dan actually says this is taken from his new book, Punk Paradox. I just finished the book a few days ago. That's funny. So go check out Punk Paradox. <clears throat> um, if anybody wants this article, I'm going to put it in the comments for you to read. And that's really it. Yeah, I just thought that would make for an interesting sort of conversation. Uh, listen. I get what I I real I agree with what Greg is saying here. I get what he's saying, but one thing I I I did not appreciate is he's telling us he's telling us that it's wrong. He's telling us reasons why it's wrong, but he's not. But, but where is the explanation as to what what is missing and what is lacking in his opinion, besides the music, besides the lyrics? Because I think punk was so was more, you know, punk is so much more than just the music. It's it's there's more to it than that. It is it is it's a community that's built around music, but it's you know, and the thing that endures more than anything else is the attitude. Is the attitude? What is the the attitude? Isn't like to be a, a contrarian. It isn't to be to go against the grain like the bad religion album, right? Isn't there a bad religion album called Against the Grain? Um, to not be contradictory towards anything that is uh, where everybody mass, con mass conforms. I don't know. <clears throat> My voice is raw, though. Uh, but that was fun. That was an interesting sort of jaunt. Check it out. Check it out. Check it all out. Um, like I said, Bad Nerves on Tuesday. Check that out. Erivan part five is ready to be exported. So if you are a Patreon member or if you are a YouTube member, keep your eyes peeled for part five. That's coming to you. And then much, much later, it'll be out on YouTube. So if you really want to, if you want to check out parts two and three, you could do so. Just the other day, I had someone commenting, where's parts two and three of that Erivan interview? You got to go to Patreon. There's a lot of stuff. There's a, there's a lot of other stuff there. There's a lot of great stuff. Again, all the all that support um, helps to finance this software that I'm using, amongst other things. So check it out. Support the creation of these products, projects. <clears throat> I'm writing something. Can't tell you what it is yet, but one day I will soon. Oh, so if you saw the Sangria, the Sangria, uh, Sangria Struggle, the sequel to Sangria Struggle is coming. So check that out. That'll be out soon. The second in this very transgressive saga. Lost Films, thought lost forever, but rescued. Being remastered and reconstituted. Part two is coming, and part three will probably come next year. So there you go. Dan says, I'm not sure how to post my channel for some live BR shows I filmed. Lots of other punk and metal shows. Just click on 322 Dan. The solo Greg show is acoustic. Cool, man. You know what I'll do, Dan? I will find your channel. I'll, I'll get off here. I'm really going to do it as soon as I get off here. And I'll share it on my community feed. Okay? So uh, to direct people where to go to find your, your channel as well. So I appreciate, appreciate you, Dan. Um, okay. That's it for today's show. Let's go out with a uh, commercial for the Patreon. And uh, we'll see you on Tuesday for Bad Nerves. More stuff coming. Uh, Stephen King coming. Lots of stuff coming. Peace. Air Grease. See you real soon. Hey, guys. What's going on? It's Jeff. So I've decided to make a Patreon. What is Patreon? I don't know how to define a Patreon. Let me look it up. 
Patreon is a membership platform that makes it very easy for creators to get paid for the things that they're already creating. I want to do it full time. I want this to be my full time job. In my efforts to make that happen, I've set up this platform. Is it going to work? Is it going to be successful? I don't know, but I would rather try and crash and burn than not try at all. The goal is to create enough passive revenue so that I can continue to do this full time uninterrupted. Why? Because I love to do this. I love creating content. I love making videos. I love shooting films. I love doing podcasts. In case you couldn't tell, I love to talk and I never shut the fuck up. <laughs> so right now I've kept the Patreon incredibly simple. There's two tiers and that may change in the future. The Murdergram is a simple way to extend support for all of the hours and hours of free content on the channel for nothing more than a dollar. 38 cents goes to Patreon. What's a buck 38, eh? It's less than a cup of coffee, but it's a great way that you can show support for very little effort. When you divide that dollar 38 by the hours and hours and hours of time spent listening to this endless drivel of content, the dollar cost average works out. Next up is the YouTube casualty for $6 and 66 cents. <laughs> The YouTube casualty is loaded to the gills. Enjoy the archive ad-free as well as ad-free early access to special docu-style podcast videos, music reaction commentaries, and the like a month before they drop on YouTube, loaded with ads, I might add. You're also going to get exclusive content and behind-the-scenes content that is not available on YouTube or anywhere else. So you get to peek behind the veil. And believe me, there's a couple of choice pieces. Most of all, more than anything, whether you join the Patreon or not, I just want to thank each and every one of you that comes to the channel, that watches all the shows, that leaves comments, that participates, that subscribes. That's really the most important thing. This is just trying to find a way to earn a living as an artist. And with that, thank you for my TED Talk. Join the Patreon, because we need you! 66 cents.